Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rupert Patel. I am the CEO and partner of Sapien Group and COO and partner of Flash Group. Today, in a fireside chat, as we have done a few times now, in even in China, in the back of a car, to on a stage, <laughs> to uh, Zoom calls, etc. We with uh, all these travel bans, we're doing it over Zoom. So, I have with me Daryl Guppy. For those few of you who don't know Daryl, he's an Australian financial analyst, written several books on trading, uh, one of which I have in Chinese, <laughs> but but the which side, can't read. which I can't read, uh, which someone exchanged it whilst we were out in Beijing. So I don't have your signed copy, so I would love to have an English version signed, signed copy sent over to me, if that's okay, Daryl. <laughs> Uh, but Daryl's also a columnist on CNBC, often operates, and uh, he's out there uh, on China Daily, The Edge, and I lose count. But dare I say, uh, he's known for his trading systems for three decades and uh, even has his own strategies, trading strategies. The GMMA, I remember you telling me, the, the Guppy Multiple uh, Moving Averages. Average. Yep, yep, I remember that. And uh, he plays a great role as an advisor to the Chinese delegation. Uh, every time Australia goes out there uh, to help with various trade related activities, uh, negotiating, speaks Chinese. So whilst in Beijing, he bailed us out a few times in restaurants ordering the food. <laughs> so that was that. But today, with all the things happening around, not only with COVID, but uh, various what I call digital wars happening between China, USA and the world. I thought it'd be good to have a chat with Daryl and just take it free format all over the place. So Daryl, welcome. And as we were saying, COVID hasn't hit uh, Australia, which is fantastic. But uh, it is very good. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's really amazing. We are suffering it in the UK. What in your view, I mean, you, you go to China a lot. What's the word on the street over there in how they are handling this and how they see it in terms of travel, number of cases? Because you hear all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, stories, whether the numbers are right or how it starts. How, how do you see it? Well, certainly in China, they have COVID very, very much under control. They crack down very, very quickly if there are even minor outbreaks what we might see perhaps as an overreaction to what's happening, but they've certainly been able to control and manage COVID much more successfully in the UK, uh, in Europe, and certainly much more successfully in the United States. Now, some people argue that that's because it's an authoritarian state. And certainly to some extent, there are things that can be done in China that would not be acceptable in the UK or in the US. However, what's important is to look at the technological approach, the tech approach that China yeah, has taken yes. to controlling COVID. That's the key difference. And I just can't understand why the United States and the UK and Europe haven't learned these particular sorts of lessons. That's the, that's the yeah. real question that comes out of 2020. Why is the West such a slow learner? We've got no problems giving all of our personal data to Google and everyone else, but if we want to surrender it, to, to for, for survival, um, yep, you can't do it. You yeah. won't do it. I, I, I have a same view, you know. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, there are, dare I say, communist way is sometimes the only way to control these things. You have to come in hard in scenarios like this. You can't be playing the middleman and diplomacy and human rights and all these uh, bullshit, sorry to say it, ways of trying to control a pandemic like this. You have to come down strong. You have to say, right, we're going to do tracing. I know in China, quite a few people, as you do, obviously, where, you know, they take one step out of their door and they are policed literally through cameras, through their mobile app. Every single person they are in contact with within a meter, they know. So if one person catches it, everybody has to know about it and gets confined down to the home. So even if they step out illegally, they are caught and punished. I mean, it needs that. It really did need that. And that's why maybe they've got it under control so much faster, right? That's certainly a, a major factor in what's going on. But that sort of, of model is not exportable to the West. And no, we perhaps no, wouldn't want it to do no. so. So let's look at what they are doing in terms of the tech side. So they made extensive use of QR codes for a start. 
yeah. so that you were able to verify that you were you'd had COVID, that you recovered from COVID, you were clean or whatever the case was. And your access to uh, public sporting venues, to shops and so on was dependent upon having a, a, a green signal on your on your handphone yeah. um, on, a, on a COVID basis. Yeah. Now, one of the problems with, with QR codes, of course, is a QR codes only access a database, they could be hacked into, they're not as secure, they're not designed with security in mind. But if you go to, uh, to blockchain fingerprint technology, which is what they're moving to now, then you've got a defined logistical chain that can't be broken. So the opportunities to, um, to gain the system and so on become much, much less. Those sorts of things can be and should be rolled out in the West. We did it in yeah. Singapore, for instance. Yeah, but you know, you, you touched on a good point about security and, and we'll get to some of that in our trading business as well. The fingerprint, you know, Google, Apple, Samsung, everybody has it on their mobile. They can take our data without our real uh, knowledge. 99% of people don't even know how much data they have on you from your financials to where you move, to where you shop, who you surf, who you, uh, literally every site you go on, Google, Facebook, know all of that. Yet, for health reasons, they cannot be doing it. And it took them so long to even start getting some form of tracing done. So I fully agree. Sometimes it's uh, very, uh, I don't know, paranoia from the governments on data privacy and security and all that. Yeah, these guys already have it and they, mm. to a certain amount, even abusing that use of data, right? So yeah, uh, fully agree, yeah, fully agree. So forget for about hacking. Yeah, forget about hacking. Having it for commercial purposes is okay. Having it for health purposes is not okay. No, it's data that's, privacy that's, intrusion. It's intrusion, that's right? That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it's very silly, very silly. So uh, let's get to what my hobby subject was when we met uh, ooh, a year and four or five months ago. I can't remember. It and December, uh, it was, in December, was it December? Uh, okay, December, December right? Just <laughs> okay, just before all just of this broke here out. in a couple of months. Here, that's true because after that, I came to London. I did Miami and then back to Bucharest. And only after almost a year, I did this travel to uh, Spain now, right? So it's a long time uh, lockdown and it's locked down here again. So I can't see yeah. much travel happening in the next few months for sure. So uh, we were talking about digital currencies and I was really uh, always saying that China will be up ahead because you mentioned the QR code, you can go and buy you know, vegetables with a QR code. You don't have to touch the banks. You don't have to touch any of that middleman, uh, what I call taking the slice of the banking system from everyone, from salaries to spend, to transfers, to remittances, all these things. So the QR code way of paying when you're in China, amazing. And now with their Chinese digital one, they just started that pilot whilst we were there. And now, um, they've actually made a statement to say they are going to peg all that digital one with the Chinese uh, currency. And they said they will do it at least for the internal markets. But uh, if you remember, I was saying this will happen for global markets. Why should the Chinese peg their uh, trading against the dollar? They are a huge economy in the world. They do lots of trillions uh, per day. Why do they need the dollar? So with this digital currency, with America not having a digital dollar or uh, we don't have a digital euro. Uh, I can see them, you know, at least two years ahead in putting a stamp on the world to say, you know what, our trade is going to be done digitally. They're already doing it with QR codes for at least two, three years that I know of. Um, and now with the digital one and the wallets, they'll be doing trades even overseas, but pegged with one. My view is the American dollar has its day it will lose a huge market share because if they do it, India do it, parts of Europe do it. I mean, you know, and I know Middle East are looking at this as well. So is uh, Russia, you know, the day the world pegs international trade on the dollar are numbered. What's your take on all this, Daryl? Yes, I agree with you. There are several other factors that, that come into play here. So, one of the consequences, one of the many consequences coming out of the Trump years was the weaponization of the dollar. Yeah. Its use as a tool of sanctions, its use as a tool to bully nations into taking actions that the Americans approved of. 
Now, this became a problem, particularly in Europe, for instance, where European companies were following uh, UN rulings in engaging in trade with various countries in the Middle East. The Americans said, you can't do that. Okay, so if they continue with that, then there are a whole range of sanctions that flow through, not just to their activities in relation to Middle East dealings, but to all of their dollar-related activities. Now, this is an unfair restraint on trade. This is a, an extension of extraterritorial, it's a very difficult word to say, <laughs> extraterritorial, <laughs> extraterritorial reach, which is, which is unjustified. Now, China became particularly worried about this. Um, they also were worried about the fact that the value of the yuan was inextricably linked to the dollar. So in fact, it was American monetary and fiscal policy was having a direct flow through back to Chinese policy. How do you separate? Well, there are two ways to do it. And one of them, the one that they've chosen is to develop a digital sovereign currency. Now that's yeah. being floated around internally at this stage, typical of the Chinese approach, which is that they will try in an experimental area, get the bugs out of it. Once that's successful, then they'll expand. So it will become the currency for cross-border trade settlement, both on small denominations, but also on large-scale denominations. And because the, the sovereign digital currency is blockchain-based, as we both know, yeah. then that provides an efficiency and a certainty that is not available for competing systems. So already we are seeing some, uh, some exporting companies out of Australia in the commodity space uh, who are using blockchain settlement based on the Chinese protocol where settlement is taking place in six and seven hours instead of 10 and 15 days. So it changes the trade environment. It gives sovereignty back to a whole range of countries that before were beholden to the United States because of their exposure to the US dollar. And that's a major threat to dollar hegemony uh, on a worldwide basis. No, absolutely. And, I, and uh, we, we touched on this as well when we met uh, uh, in Beijing. And, and those, those pilots uh, ha have gone successful. They did it in four major cities. Uh, and now I see that, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, they said they want to roll it out internally, at least, as you've just said. Yeah. But absolutely, the, the day this thing goes mainstream, at least they've made their mark, they've put their foot down and said, this is the way we are going to go. We are going to peg it with our uh, sovereign currency, as you've said. Mm. In terms of economy, um, again, my view was before 2030, China will overtake America. This is another step it's doing, because even if you look at, you know, 7 trillion in trading daily volumes, you know, I'm sure China has a huge percentage of that 7 trillion on a daily basis. But other countries following this and China stipulating people to do it against their currency as well, in blockchain, you can easily, uh, you know, uh, swap the currencies again without going through the SWIFT and the big American right. clearing banks and all of that. So all that middleman is gone. So they lose even that revenue. So in my view, China will definitely, the way it's going now, hit the number one slot before 2030. What's, what's your take on that? Oh, I would certainly agree. And the fact that you have genuine uh, economic recovery and growth in China uh, is part of that process. What we perhaps underestimate is, and it's even easier to underestimate uh, in the last uh, 12 months because of the lack of travel and communication with China, is the growth and efficiency of the 5G environment and how that trades through to Internet of Things, artificial intelligence and so on. So we all observed with some interest, I suppose, the, estab the establishment of the hospital in Wuhan within a few days, within 10 days. It was a rapid, rapid construction point. That's only one thing that's of particular interest. The question is, how did they start that? Yeah, and absolutely. The answer is that they used robots yep. to deliver yep. the food and the medicines, and those robots fed off an advanced 5G network. Absolutely. That absolutely. meant that there was no cross-contamination so the control that took place within that environment was much superior to the control that we have in our environments, which rely purely on, on, on individuals who don't make mistakes and aren't working second jobs and all the rest of the, uh, the hoo-ha that goes around it. So we underestimate the degree to which the Chinese economy and the Chinese environment has become an advanced IT environment. These concepts are talked about in the West. They are in practice already 
in China. And it's that, it's that advance that gave China particular advantages in handling COVID and managing COVID. It's too simplistic to say that China's success with COVID is because it's an authoritarian communist country. That is not the answer. It is the reliance on high levels of technology uh, and IT advance that allowed this systematic control to develop quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. And and the uh, blockchain part of the implementation of it, uh, you know, uh, okay, some cynics would say uh, they are controlling how people spend the money, who they spend it with, where they spend it, what time they spend it, and the government knows about taxation. You know, in my view, uh, there's pluses and minuses. Yes, you lose some of your uh, privacy and the government has a say in, hey, you, you're buying too many American goods or you're buying too many X, Y, and Z goods, cut it down, slow it down, or you, where are you getting so much income and you haven't paid the taxes on, etc. Those are some of the downsides in the policing side of blockchain because everything can be tracked when you are on that digital one. However, the plus is, you know, it keeps the economy stronger. It will get to that number one slot, in my view, because if you don't do that, you get end up like in India, where, you know, less than 5% of people actually pay proper taxes in that country, right? So uh, you can't get growth that fast. So uh, in terms of outlook for China, you know, I think because of the fast adoption of, of blockchain, digital currencies, and using uh, AI, based technologies, a lot of automation. Uh, I think they are scaling much, much faster because uh, even what they are known for is production is getting automated to get even more production for one of better words. So, so they are scaling their old reputation of production into a major scale where people may be even forced to say, you know, we can't compete with them. No matter what you do, you can embargo them. You can do a digital war with them. You can do a cold war with them. You cannot survive when they can produce things at a fraction of the cost you do in your countries. So uh, what's what's your take on this year with moving slightly into the American, not the politics, but with the Dems and the whole uh, America, China trade wars, how do you see that impact China in terms of economy this year going forward and the impact on even America? Okay, before I answer that part of the question, I'm going yeah. to go back a little bit to yeah, some, some issues that you raised. So one of the key advantages of a sovereign digital currency is that it is the most effective attack on corruption. Absolutely. Now, we say that the common idea of China is that the China is rife with corruption. And that was certainly true um, 10 or 20 years ago, less and less so, particularly under Xi Jinping and his Tigers and Flies campaign, but corruption still remains a fact of life. But once you move to a, digi a sovereign digital currency, then yes, you do track money flows and it is a major tool against eliminating corruption, not just at petty levels, but at major levels. So that's a plus for the economy overall because the burden of Absolutely. corruption increases costs across the board. The second factor, which is underestimated, is that blockchain technology through the digital wallet, through a sovereign digital currency, gives you virtually real-time feedback information on the state of the economy, how it's developing, where it's weak, where it's strong, the components of that economic development. And as policy-making tools, that's unparalleled anywhere in the world. So Absolutely. although China is often criticised for having statistics out, you know, three days after the end of the month, yeah, that's probably a valid criticism. They're still useful because they're all compiled in the same way. But a move towards a sovereign digital currency means that those statistics will become more accurate and more granular. And that's really important for managing the growth of this massive country. Yeah. Uh, just to add on to that um, modelling, in our own blockchain, our uh, blockchain is called OZT, uh, we are also looking at uh, what we call the velocity impact on the of our gold peg coin. So even though our coin is pegged against gold, there is some volatility because there's a price of gold. And then what we have is an intrinsic value of the pegging of our coin. 
However, based on number of transactions, who is transacting, the volumes, the number of master nodes, how many people are staking, how many people are on the network uh, 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 passing money around, uh, everything costs money in terms of transaction. But how do you control that velocity rather than being rampant like this, what we see in the crypto space? How do you keep it so it's slowly growing? So this velocity modeling that we are doing is with uh, really uh, uh, reinforce deep learning technologies forget about normal deep, uh, deep learning but uh, AI reinforced uh, deep learning and right down to uh, sophisticated decision making analysis where to the minute you will know what impact you would have on the price of your coin the users the throughput the liquidity etc so China doing that at the country level will make a huge difference not only in the economy but collecting taxes corruption all of these things and uh, you know i touched on it people like india could really use doing this i mean they are slow again because it's democracy and all that so sometimes authoritarian things work let's get to this <laughs> outlook now <laughs> authoritarian i mean i'm for that and living in lived in romania for a little while okay it's past the ceausescu days but uh, sometimes that way works because otherwise you can't have progress. Everyone's out there debating and we all know government people like to sit around, have meetings after meeting, take votes, take polls rather than just do it. Yeah. I think one of the important things when we're talking about Western economies <laughs> is the way that um, that critical economic figures are manipulated um, yeah. and a reliance on a sovereign currency takes away that ability to manipulate. So for instance, in Australia, um, we are quite proud of our employment rate. The only problem is that if you work one hour a week, one hour per week, you're counted as employed. Jesus. So that sort of distorts the yeah. employment environment. Oh if you're using a sovereign digital currency, then those weaknesses, those falsehoods are, are fairly easily yeah. sorted out from the yeah. data. Um, so it's not a matter of being authoritarianism. Uh, it's a matter of having access to those sorts of statistics in real time that improves policy making. So but back to your question about Biden and the new government outlooks and whether that's going to dial back uh, the, the rhetoric between America and China. I think, yes, it will. It's an opportunity to reset the way in which the relationship is conducted. Politically within the United States, I don't see that there is much room to roll back the sort of approach that Trump is taking regarding sanctions and various other odds and ends. But the methodology and the techniques that are used will be very, very different. And I'm reminded in some ways of a, 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 an apocryphal story about Roosevelt. Um, and Roosevelt was was asked, you know, it's, it's, it's a waste. Why do we put air in, in rubber tyres? It's a waste of time. It's not necessary. Why don't we just yeah. use plain old rubber wheels? And Roosevelt's <laughs> response uh, was, well, you know, it certainly makes the ride smoother. And that's the situation <laughs> that I think we're likely to see with Biden. We're still getting to the same destination, but the ride will be smoother because it will be more diplomatic. But Biden has tremendous tasks to rebuild a fractured America. Uh, and already we're seeing, for instance, that the, the ICE, the Immigration Control Group, um, who has been directed to stop um, uh, yeah. deportations, in fact, is defying the president and continuing deportations. That's, that, that sits at the core of a major domestic problem. So I suspect that Biden's interest in the America-China problem in foreign affairs is going to be far, far less intense. It's going to be well down the, the, the order list. So there's some opportunity for some of his advisors to, to run their own game with very little reference to Biden, that is potentially a danger. Although at this stage, we don't have people like Peter Navarro and so on who are real China hawks. But yeah, I think that we'll see a more diplomatic approach. I think China will respond to that. Um, less, 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 less conflictual. Less yeah, I think it'll be more cooperative. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit more cooperative. Yeah. So how do you see it impacting the markets? This is, this is our babies now. <laughs> how do you see all this external functions generally has a big impact on markets how the markets perform be it in the crypto market or in traditional stocks and forex markets how do you see that 2021 panning out 
Well, I think one of the main interesting things that came out of 2020 is that despite America's very aggressive attempts to contain and sanction China, foreign direct investment in China increased and increased quite substantially. So that tells us that the rest of the world sees that the opportunities in China are simply too large to ignore. Correct. And the signing of the enhanced investment agreement between the European Union and China is also evidence of that particular push. So from the perspective of the Chinese economy, I see that that's likely to continue to grow. But more importantly, it's likely to attract a great deal more foreign direct investment and capital investment into their expanding financial markets. So Shanghai Shenzhen will get to the stage where they're able to become strong, viable alternatives to US capital markets. Now, Trump succeeded in undermining the integrity of US capital markets by threatening to delist China companies, for instance, uh, and so on. So there is a sovereign risk, a growing sovereign risk of direct investment or listing in the United States. The United States economy, the, the the, the Dow, the NASDAQ, S&P and so on, are all strongly trending upwards and likely to continue to do so. We don't see if there's any major economic collapse that's likely to take place at this stage, but that's, you look at the fundamentals of the American economy and you have to say, what's happening in the market doesn't reflect the fundamentals. Either the market has to come back to the fundamentals or the fundamentals have to catch up to the market. Biden will get at least 12 months to try and get the fundamentals to catch up to the market. Um, at this stage, it's not an opportunity to short US markets. We wouldn't be doing that, but we'd certainly be looking to continue to go long, but taking care because what will happen is there will be some pullbacks and one of those pullbacks will develop into a major trend change. That becomes a key factor. So we look for end of trend patterns to develop things like head and shoulder patterns, for instance, or rounding tops, really advanced technical terms, those are. No, 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 <laughs> both, of them. Exactly. no, bo no both of them, yeah. <laughs> when we see those developing, that will be the, the, the signal for caution and start to take money out. Um, but at this stage, it remains a fantasy land, out of touch with the economic reality. But, but uh, you know, so my, my, view, my view is, uh, yes, whether you, you're trending, uh, oh, sorry, trading with uh, with patterns, be it head and shoulders or rounding heads or double dips or whatever it is. Uh, I see the flags happening now, you know, a lot of the flags happening now and there could be breakout ups or downs. Two reasons. One, America is printing money like it's like no value. It's really I, I don't know whether they register or people register. Someone somewhere has to pay for it. And once that penny drops, I see a downward trend or some form of correction. So I would say uh, if you're long, be long with four or six pairs of eyes if you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can't be long blindly because all this will catch up. And then you've got the second variable, which is the COVID and the furloughs and all that. People don't realize that in, in my case, I've been working from home and I can work anywhere with a laptop and a mobile phone, uh, but people have now got used to working from home or mobile. All these office spaces, real estate, and all the multiple reciprocal businesses will be hit. So we've already seen the travel, we've already seen the hospitality, we will see the real estate and all this coming down like a pack of cards as well. So that coupled with job losses, there has to be some, not only a correction, but some form of a recession, depression, whatever you call it. Where, where do you see that? Not if we keep on printing money. And that's very much the American approach. So the yeah. key question becomes, who is prepared to buy US treasuries? Who is prepared to buy US debt and at what levels? Yeah. So for a leading indication of this economic collapse where the market comes back to the fundamentals, because that's really what we're talking about, then it's going to be the treasuries that are going to give the, the leading indication of that. When treasury buying dries up, when they're not able to have treasuries funded externally, when international buying, for instance, that becomes the key warning sign. That's when the music stops, is perhaps the best way of putting it. Now, why hasn't that music stopped? Because 
you could argue to a very significant extent, there has been no viable alternative. But a viable alternative is developing, and this goes back to digital yuan, sovereign yeah. digital currencies, yeah. domestic use at the moment. But once that expands into an international environment, and we see this feeding through to the expansion of Chinese bond markets at the moment, which are open to international bidding and so on. And the amount of activity in China's bond markets is substantial. Once they start listing other bonds, then you start to see alternatives to this American pool. And money, as we both know, is particularly fiat currencies, which is what the, uh, what the US dollar is at this point in time, are very much reliant upon public confidence. And that buying in the treasuries is going to get the best indication of what that public confidence is. And when it begins to retreat, that's the signal to start moving out of the market. Because at the moment, it's the relief checks that are going through that are being ploughed back into the, the financial markets, which is creating this massive bubble. We wouldn't necessarily call it a, um, uh, irrational exuberance, as uh, was labelled <laughs> in the past. Let's, let's, let's call it... Yeah. It's close to it. COVID, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's very close to it. But uh, yeah, I mean, you made a good point, And that's why I think it will go down, because now you've seen some of the really big guys. And I'm talking about even the Elon Musk's of the world and uh, even Bezos, so two of the richest people in the world. When they make statements to say, hang on, why don't we do things with Bitcoin? That means they are already doing it. OK. They've yeah. already started taking uh, that into their uh, payment system. So they're cutting all that middleman out. And they're also saying, you know, without saying it straight, the American dollar is not worth putting all your money in. Put it in these sorts of digital currencies. And if those two, and um, I know a few other bigger players out there already doing it, like the Tim Drapers of the world who I know and met, uh, and... Uh, you just need a handful of the biggest ones doing it and there in it comes another collapse right mm. so that feed and trust and all these things you mentioned in my view is already happening you see what's happening with the uh, with the coinbase scenario with paypal they are all looking to do this now they've already started so uh doing it and accepting crypto for payments uh, and Coinbase does the transfers and PayPal is even beginning to take it, Amazon. So it's already happening. So it's just a matter of time when I guess the average person gets their head around it. Um, and I've written a book on this in my COVID times, how to help people understand all this. Uh, I'll send that one to you uh, Good, once it's once it's finished signed in fact i'll get you to write a testimonial how about that <laughs> you do the you do the you do the traditional stock side and i've got trading patterns i've got all of this covered wallets blockchain currencies DeFi, CFI, the whole nine yards as a guide so have a have a traditional market opinion on it and uh, <laughs> yeah. and and that helps you see it needs education so once the american population gets uh, uh educated i think that will happen and uh, it's just a matter of two three years five years tops you know uh, because it's moving that fast yes i would agree and a major economic shock and COVID continues to reverberate uh, not just through our, uh, our health systems and our living styles but it will reverberate through the, the economy the the, the long-term structural impacts of COVID and of the associated flooding of free money into the environment will, as you suggest, come to an end. Now, whether that's a rapid end resulting in some sort of crash like the 1930s or whether it's a slow change, is a, that's an unanswered question. It's a moot question at this point in time. It's open to debate. But yes, I agree with what you're doing. And I have a new book coming out in the middle oh, of the year, uh, which good. is looking at trading techniques and it covers a little bit of Bitcoin. I will send you a copy with a signature oh, as well. No, done, done. I'll, I'll send you my PDF version. Yeah. Uh, you can have a quick look and if it helps you yeah. in yours, not a problem. I'll Very do a good. testimonial on yours as well. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Problem is that you know, COVID makes work for idle keyboards. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you know, the, the computer sales have gone up for obvious reasons, <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. So coming to markets now, and uh, we mentioned, or you mentioned rather, the Americans trying to uh, 
uh, to sanction or ban some of the uh, Chinese traded stocks on NASDAQ or Dow or wherever. Um, uh, I, I got into NEO, if, you've, if you know mm -hmm. of them, uh, at quite an early stage, and it's gone crazy over the last three months. Um, and uh, where do you see the Chinese market and Chinese uh, goods now, like this Bang and NEO in the EV market, how they uh, affect the stock market and challenge people like like the Teslas of the world, but over even on the blockchain side of things and uh, digital uh, uh, financial fintech based companies, there are loads and loads coming out of China uh, with amazing technologies. How, how do you see that if you're tracking that side of the market? Okay, so at this point in time, we've got a, as you've noted, a whole range of companies coming out of them. Which ones are going to survive in the long term? That's something that you can't predict at this point in time. So in trading that environment, you either need a good spread across all of them and exchange traded funds are a way to reach that. And then as that market becomes weeded out, as, a, as the survivors become winners, then you shift investments into those sorts of areas. I suppose one of the important things to consider at the moment is CG Ping's but, approach. But do you do you look do right. you look at do you look at investing when it's just about going up, or do you look at the the old school buy the dip and sell on the peak? Do you watch it when it's just about to take off, or do you wait for the dip? Uh, how, how how do you go about it? You're so twentieth century. <laughs> No, no, because I don't look at I don't look at these uh, old school trading things. That's what I hear. In crypto, but, it's totally different. Trade, but what I what I mean by that particular comment, yeah, is that yeah, that's the old method of yeah. investing and, and and trading, and what you're taking on is individual stock risk, and that's a high risk environment because yeah. yes, you can trade counter trend, what we call fading the trend. It's yeah. in the down and it's only just beginning yeah. to turn. You buy it there and hope yeah. it'll keep on moving up or you can join something that's already moving up. So you're taking on individual stock risk. One of the things that particularly has come out of post-2008, it's accelerated in 2020, is the growth of the derivative markets, the exchange-traded funds. Yeah. And what they are doing is they are ameliorating that risk. They're spreading that risk across multiple areas. So instead of looking at the risk of an individual stock, in a con it becomes a component of an ETF. So by taking the ETF, you're able to essentially track the entire sector without taking the individual stock risk. Now, of course, you miss those stocks that go up quite dramatically, like NEO, for instance. Yeah. But then again, they are a major component of the ETF. So you pick up a fraction of that particular approach. It's a little bit like the early days of video chase where you had uh, yeah, Betamax yeah. and um, and VHS. We might argue that Betamax was a better system than VHS, and that's a common argument within the industry. But the reality was that VHS became the dominant thing. You couldn't tell that at the time. You could take a lucky bet and get on VHS instead of Beta. So in this situation, you have the ability to ride the ETF in its current environment, which gives you exposure to all of those stocks, and then as the leaders begin to emerge, then transfer your trading or investment to those particular to the stocks. individual stock. Yeah, and so you look at stock. you look at the derivatives and the ETFs for the sector, for the market right. sector, uh, right. and and based on those averages, how they are moving in the futures market or wherever, then uh, you say, okay, this market is worth going for because there's a better outlook on futures. So in your view, I mean, I I, I look at hospitality, EV market, things like that. Uh, okay, so who's going to survive in hospitality? Yeah, that's right. I, I would stay away from it. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I would yeah, stay but away from it. On the other it. hand, if you take an ETF. But it will come in... up based on what time. That's all it is. That's right. Yeah. So you, you've taken an ETF that's based on hospitality. Yeah. Right? So it's following that sector of the industry. And it's beginning to move up. Yes. But it's still uncertain whether it's, it's going to be, uncertain. for instance, married or intercontinental or whatever, for argument's sake. Yes. But yeah. we know the ETF's moving. Out. Okay, ride that ETF for a start. That will give you that general sector increase. And then as the leaders began to emerge, then you transfer and take that individual stock risk. Into individual spot. Yeah, absolutely. That's right, yeah. because the, 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 the initial part of that change that's taken place in the trend, you've minimised the risk by total market exposure 
rather than by individual stock risk. So that's what I mean by not being 20th century. You're using no, the no, power no. of the derivative spread to minimise the risk in the market as those sectors begin to emerge and develop and then identifying the leaders in those sectors, be a hedge versus leader for argument's sake, and taking longer term positions there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, so I look at market uh, sectors. So in in uh, in the crypto world, there's various. So there is in the DeFi space or traditional crypto, but even there we have individual different sectors. So you could be talking about uh, loans or uh, mm -hmm. yield farming or passive income ways of doing things. You can be looking at uh, insurances. You can be looking at asset backed. Uh, tokens. You could be looking at protocol types of things. So these are the sectors that it, we don't have. Uh, it's early days. We don't have ETFs per sector, but we have ETFs per coin or per individual token, mm. things like that. But as a sector, I have like top 50. And then uh, you look at individual uh, ones and you see an average uh, how that whole collection goes but there is no etf for a sector for just loans or or fintech or prop tech or health tech or whatever it may be so it's uh, a wonderful opportunity that's exactly what i was going to say so I've, I've developed what we call a heat map i've developed a heat map yeah, yeah. uh that does that but uh, to get live feeds on it is is a bit complicated and we're looking at bots as well to do this with again the same uh, reinforce deep learning ways of doing it uh, for all sorts of different types of trading. So again, we look at the sectors with the ETFs, but to find that heat map with live trades on a mm. on a time step is uh, is you know is something we have to do because those kind yeah. of signals and uh, feeds are not available. So yeah, it's just, it's not difficult because most of the exchanges nowadays let you have APIs into the exchanges anyway. So it's quite right. it's quite quite easy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your view now? We we had a debate in Beijing as well. I remember saying, you know, uh, traditional stocks operate in a certain way, and the crypto and DeFi and or, or digital assets operate in a certain way, which is more sentimental. I'd like to bring it back to what I've just recently seen with uh, with this big debacle. That uh, I don't know. I want to hear your view on this GME. You know the games, <laughs> <laughs> because you know that kind of stuff happens in the crypto world, all right? Yeah. Okay. It happens almost all the time. To see it in the traditional stock and then hitting it, it's like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll use games, GameStop GME as, as as a working example because it yeah. applies across the board. One of, of the course. important differences, of course, is that the hedge fund gathers retail money into a single spot and yes. they deploy it. Yeah. This is more, uh, let's call it a coordinated drone attack it, it where is. individual <laughs> money still remains individual but are following a particular, uh, particular policy or objective or strategy. So there's a bit of a difference between the two approaches. And I suspect that we're likely to see more of this, let's call it coordinated uh, individual, um, individual. We call agents. it FOMO. We call it FOMO in in our crypto world. Fear what, of mi missing out. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So we call it FOMO movements, and there are so many Telegrams and Reddit groups and all this doing yeah, it true, true. falsely hiking. But this happens all the time. It in, happens. In the it world. happens in the traditional industry it, all the time. Yeah. Okay. So let's reverse this situation. What we've got is hedge funds who took short positions with GameShop. So they were betting that it would go down. And they were massive positions. And they were releasing to the market a whole range of negative stories about GameShop, trying to force the price down. Because if the price fell, they were going to make, as we would say, a mozza. They make an awful lot of money in the process. And that's a standard approach. Now, they call themselves activist investors or hedge funds that are weeding out the weak and so on and so forth. But no, no, it's a type of market manipulation where they are doing a report. Before they release the negative report, they are taking open short positions in the market, releasing the report in anticipation of that price going down so that they can sell out 
and take short profits. Now, what's happened here with GME is that this field of autonomous robots, for want of a better word, or drones, have said, no, we can, we can push the price up. We can create a, what's called a short squeeze. And because the price goes up, it means that the value of the underlying asset against which the hedge funds have borrowed, they've got to put up more money to cover their shorts. They've got to cover their positions Absolutely. or get out. And to do that, they have to buy more stock. And because their positions were so large, that pushed the price up dramatically. Now, there's another line of the argument that says, oh, there's all this volatility, you know, 20% a day and 50% and 70 It's all due to those amateur retail traders. What a load of, to you to Shakespeare. Yeah, exactly. Term, what a load of Codswallop. Codswallop. Because remember, absolutely. remember, on, I think it was the Thursday, getting the time zones right is a bit difficult. Yeah. There was a like single a day. <laughs> there was a single day where retail traders were not able to trade GameStop. Yep. The movement for the day, high to low, 76%. That's not volatility put in by retail traders. That's volatility put in by hedge funds trying to cover. Now we have the situation where the price is falling again. I'd be interested to well, know. Well, it's almost 70. I'm, I'm looking now. Yesterday it closed almost 75, 78 or something like that. It touched. So if I'm selling, who's buying? Yeah. yeah. Someone's on the other side of that trade buying. No, no, absolutely. And it'll be the same hedge funds again. <laughs> it's, obvious. So it's obvious. So the interesting thing about the situation is not that it's happened, but that it's a replication of the tactics that are used by hedge funds anyway, except that this has been done by what we might call retail and what the market or what the media wants to call amateur investors. They're not amateur. The sophisticated tools that were once the exclusive purview of hedge funds are now available on any desktop. Any desktop. And that's Absolutely. the difference. That's Absolutely. The difference. So do you think these sorts of people should be brought to justice when it comes to organized uh, manipulation of stock? Oh, only if they're retail investors. <laughs> uh, it happens all that. the time that at the institutional the level. Institution is always happening. And, you know, someone asked me an interesting question on a panel the other day. They say, uh, oh, no, in the traditional markets, this don't happen. And I said, get real. You know, dare I say the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgans yeah. of the world, they are constantly doing this. <laughs> They're constantly manipulating pricing. Right. You know, it's been happening for decades. You know, it's not That's a right. today thing. And the manipul manipulation of prices is different from inside trading. That's very important to make that. Yeah, decision. no, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. And when you've got the American situation where you have what's called a made market as distinct from an order driven market. So in an order driven market, you might offer to, to sell me shares for $100. I'm prepared to pay $100. So our orders are matched. And yeah. they're matched basically as if on, you on and the I order were, book. Yeah, just like in with the order other. book. Yeah. No, 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 no. This is very important difference. Now, oh, you mean the US uh, system? There's a market maker that sits in the, the middle. market so maker. Sell, yeah, 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 yeah. But I sell. I'm actually selling to the market maker, not directly on the market. Yes, yes. The market maker has to make his edge, his commission. He has to clip yes. the ticket yeah, as yeah. it goes through. Yeah, yeah. So, although I've been prepared to sell at 100, he may be prepared. He may put my order in at 99. It's called yes. slippage. Yep. Uh, because he's making a dollar on that round he's got to make a dollar. that's taking yeah. place. Yeah. So once you've got that in itself, that in itself lends itself to market manipulation of prices. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. easily corrupted. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have automated market makers now happening all the time in the blockchain space, yeah. you know, and uh, I don't They're know whether it's... for free. Yeah, nothing's for free, you know, and, and mm. I don't... At least... It's a lot more transparent, for want of better words, than what's happening behind closed doors. So uh, you know what the slippage or the number of pips mm -hmm. that each element is, uh, each part of the buyer or the seller is taking. So uh, at least it's more transparent rather than yeah, the we, other way. Yeah, we say flip the ticket. It's like a conductor on a train. You know, he, he goes fast. Yeah, the flip ticket, the ticket. Yeah, yeah. Takes yeah. An <laughs> And got a long trip. You got nothing left at the end of it. Yeah, now, now you're going. Much now you're going. Now you are going 20th century with me. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic.
Well, Daryl, that was great, great. We have some books to share. We have some testimonials to share. I'll ping you, <laughs> I'll ping you mine once it's drafted, finished, and uh, you do the same. Um, it was great having you. Any closing remarks, comments? I think it's probably best summed up by Julie Garland, Garland actually. Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, remember? Follow the yellow brick road. road. Yeah, yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, No, 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 no. We ain't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I love it. I love Situations it. Situations changed. We're still going to use the same trading changed. techniques, but the leakage between the fundamentals and what we're seeing on market activity is much larger, much more stretched than it used to be. Yeah. We have it to is. trade what we're seeing and then wait, anticipate and be prepared for the snapback that will either be a market collapse that comes back to fundamentals or this massive growth of the economy. I know which one I'm betting on. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would say to anyone that, you know, if uh, if you think trading is all about signals and patterns and strategies, there are so many external factors, especially in the crypto and digital space where you will not know which whale is going to come in and do what because there's no pattern, no strategy. Uh, right. This is pure market sentiments and whale sentiments, organized, as you call it as well, organized trading uh, through movements that is outside your control. So tread carefully. Yeah. I mean, if I had my if I had my druthers, as we would say, I'd give you an image to end with. And on one side, there'd be a picture of Nostradamus, and on the other side, a picture of Elba Camus. Oh, yeah. And that really Great. sums up the difference in the approach to the market. Nostradamus says, we can predict the future. Trust us. Whereas Camus says, I haven't got a clue what's going to happen. The best I can do is manage what develops. And that's where we sit very much. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Good point. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, sorry we got the days wrong, but that's what happens when you're on the other side of the timeline, <laughs> down under. True. And uh, I hope to see you soon. I hope this thing all uh, goes by and we can meet in person again and share the odd Chinese and you can order some nice Chinese for us. <laughs> <laughs> I shall do that. I'm looking forward to traveling myself. Yeah, and I'm stay sure. Well we... and stay, stay, stay well and stay healthy. And you, buddy. And you're nice chatting to you as usual. Speak later. Very good. Good. Shit. Cheers. Bye, buddy. Bye.